Yeah, so there will be um, winners and losers or people who are more or less affected. But the one comment I'd like to make is that climate has not been stable for a very long time. And, and people should know that there's a difference between weather and climate. Climate is a measure of about 30 years worth of daily weather. Mm -hmm. um, weather is what happens today and tomorrow. And, and what we've seen from the Industrial Revolution in the 1860s through the current time is that as the temperature of the Earth has increased, the variability of the climate at each place has increased. So mm -hmm. here in the Northeast, we're actually going to see um, higher highs and um, some lower lows and lots of storms. Mm -hmm. What's going to happen globally and what happens at each place globally depends on um, is being predicted by different models. Mm -hmm. But what seems to, to happen is that there will be some places on the earth that are going to get more arid. So for example, Central Africa, the tropical part of Africa will get much drier and, and much hotter. Parts of the Amazon basin, they're predicting, will get much hotter and um, much drier. Within North America, um, the wet sort of climate of the American Midwest is actually going to shift north to um, to Canada. But it's this complex interaction, and it's a little bit hard to predict, but there's a cycle, mm -hmm. and that cycle is that as the, the air temperature warms, surface water temperatures warm. And everybody's done this experiment mm -hmm. by leaving something that our parents think should have been placed in a refrigerator mm -hmm. and they've left it on a counter and then got yelled for it. Why? Because it's warmed up. It will assume the air temperature. So as air temperature warms up, more it's easier for water with wind to be evaporated into the atmosphere. Mm -hmm. And the way it works is, is that what for water, what goes up comes down. Mm -hmm. The big question then is why will some places get drier? And that's because they're predicting that for many parts of the world, that evaporated water will rain out over the oceans and therefore be lost to continental systems for quite a while. Mm -hmm. And what's going to happen also is that not only for the evaporated water hitting, but also the warmer sea temperatures are melting um, ice caps. And this is happening um, with Greenland, with the ice sheets in Greenland. Mm -hmm. We've seen big pieces of yeah. Antarctic ice sheets breaking. And also, 55 glaciers are in retreat worldwide. For example, on the Tibetan Plateau, we've had these mm -hmm enormous tragedies where too much meltwater has come down and flooded out these villages. So what that's doing is elevating um, sea surfaces. And we can see um, in parts of the United States and other parts of the world, particularly out in um, the tropical Pacific, that many homelands are about being lost. Places like Vanuatu um, and parts of Micronesia, these people are about not only to be displaced, but their homeland will go um, entirely. So there are going to be winners and losers, and the question then is what, what to do about it. Frederic, and you've worked in different parts of the world, uh, in, in, and with, with different kinds of communities. And in that work, have you seen how, communi how are communities responding to, to changes in climate? I mean, what, and I guess over a long period of time, human groups have, have had to respond to, to changes. How, how, what kind of responses have you seen in, in these different areas? Well, I have to say that in India, I have not seen responses, mm -hmm. but I, I left uh, doing work in India in the early 90s. Okay. So uh, in Peru, I am amazed at how little people are aware. People are aware that well, the way they, they speak, they say the rains have gone crazy. I see. The rains have yeah. gone crazy. Yeah. So, and and I, this summer they were really crazy. I mean, yeah. when it's supposed to be dry, mm -hmm. 
uh, the driest part of the of the year, it was pouring every day, and there was mold everywhere. Mm. So people are aware of it. But what uh, amazes me is how poorly uh, the educational system or the media mm -hmm. is addressing the issue. Yes, it's just not. Yeah, you've talked before about um, environmental literacy, right? And and so one of the most in, important things we can do is just to make people more aware of the danger we're in. And but what, why why do you think that? The media hasn't been more effective in in showing these dangers. I'm stumped. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, my my very superficial imp impression is that uh, you know, me in in a lot of the global south. It's true of India. It's true of Peru. The places mm -hmm. I know best. Uh, I know a bit Morocco, and I think it's true in Morocco mm -hmm. as well. Um, the the global south is you know in a trance about modernity and all the goodies mm -hmm. that it they brings also want to give up those and near term possibilities yes the the people who are more attuned with it are the indigenous people mm -hmm. because they have not many of them have not bought into that lifestyle mm -hmm. and they are aware they are, for example, uh, that is why they came to my center. They say, our children will not be able to do slash and burn. Mm -hmm. The forest mm -hmm. is, go is going. Right. And if we cannot grow our own food, we are at the mercy of the market. We have to sell our labor. You know, our yes. culture is threatened, our identity, our autonomy. Mm -hmm. So they are aware. And there's a wonderful documentary about the Kogi of... Mm -hmm. uh, of Colombia, a native group, and they have very fine, they read the landscape, they read the earth with great precision mm -hmm. and discrimination, and they know what is happening. And the ones who really know are the Inuits. I mean, they are extremely affected, extremely affected mm -hmm. there, and they know it. So the ones who are most aware are also the ones who have no power. <laughs> ah, yes. yes. <laughs> and little voice. Yeah. So it's sad, but that's yeah, the I, case. Yeah, I, I was just, I'm just reviewing a book by a um, psychologist, uh, Daniel uh, Goleman, uh, a book called Focus, in which he argues, I'm, I'm not really persuaded by this, but that that um, it's, it's evolution that makes us focus on short-term, our brains are, are meant to focus on short-term dangers, you know, and, uh, and that we are not wired, as, as people like to say today, for looking at long-term systemic issues. And, uh, and so um, even though these so-called long-term issues are, you know, dec within decades having dramatic effect on us, uh, that it's much easier to worry about um, how many jobs will be created if we build this pipeline, or what's the price of gas next week, or if you have a carbon tax, um, you're going to have uh, some reduction in GDP. Uh, the, the, which are these are not insignificant issues, but we we but we focus on them exclusively, uh, and rather than look at long-term systemic issues, because it's just much harder for our brains to do that. Well, that that gives me the opportunity to speak about a book I love, uh -huh. Ian McGilchrist, uh -huh. The Master and His Emissary. Uh -huh. He is a neurosurgeon, mm -hmm. and uh, he's written an amazing book about uh, the bilateral brain, yes. you know, re re-evaluating the old mm -hmm. scholarship on this. And I'm going to summarize yes. horribly <laughs> his okay. very long book. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that what Daniel Goldman has identified mm -hmm. is a left brain, right. uh, which is, of course, what we moderns have uh, put all our eggs Sweet. into that basket. Yeah. So we have a hypertrophied uh, left brain and an atrophied right brain. Yeah. And he says it's a disaster. Yeah. We have, because these other, uh, you know, the right brain, um, according to him, it, you know, the language, yeah. but a t certain type of language, yes. of course, very influenced by our alphabet, which is linear mm -hmm. and uh, anthropocentric, totally phonetic, the human right. voice, that's all. 
And whereas the right brain has the metaphorical language, mm -hmm. the sounds, music, yeah. metaphor, uh, the arts, all of these things, and, and it's a different kind of knowledge yes. ga gaining, a uh, way of apprehending and being in the world. And he says it is absolutely necessary. We have totally unbalanced this. Yes. Uh, because the kind of uh, precision and observation that we get from uh, indigenous people about the climate change, and they are very, very precise, yes is a right brain. Mm -hmm. So the, the indigenous people, yeah. you could say, are hypertrophied in their right brain and atrophied in their left brain. But, you know, you could say that. Some people say that. But we certainly need to balance. These. So this question of balance or integration is, 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 is key in a lot of, in a lot of respects. Yeah. Uh, uh, the, the, the intersection of climate change and evolution is something I thought we might talk a little bit about because um, you know, there are commentators who have said that, you know, climate change has been part of evolution for a long, long time. Technology may amplify this. We may have more rapid changes right now. But climate, like humans, are parts are responding to evolution or part of evolution. And, and we ought to think about it that way uh, in the future. Yeah, the, the relationship between climate change and evolution is really fascinating because the planet has not been stable in its climate throughout its entire history. Right. And organisms have evolved, they've gone extinct. Right. Um, the environmental surfaces of the planets have changed um, dramatically through time. So the question is, is are we driving something different than that normally happens and should we be concerned about it? And, and the answer is, is, is that we're actually driving it you know, in a, during a period where the Earth should actually be cooling. We're actually making the Earth warmer when, in fact, natural processes would be making the Earth cooler. So we're driving it in an artificial way. How do we know the processes would be making it cooler? I mean, if, 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 there's, if there's a quick answer, Brilliant geophysicists, you know, looking, <laughs> looking at these patterns, um, these patterns and um, where we are in the relationship of the sun and everything else, we should actually be in a, in a slight cooling period. Mm -hmm. And we are in a, in a very, very big warming trend. So yes, we're evolving, we're driving evolution in organisms. They either can make it or they can't make it. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the plant crops relating right. to human, they're um, diminishing and um, humans have to make a, uh, are, are making a change. It's having different differential impacts. But the fact of the matter is, is that through big climatic catastrophes that have happened on the planets, we've had these big mass extinctions. Right. And in those, there have been losers and winners. For example, after the last natural one, um, mammals, um, and, and as a result, humans actually came into being right. um, after the Cretaceous, the big Cretaceous tertiary extinction. So is it a good thing? Is it a bad thing? The answer is, is it was just if you're it a was a, just a thing. <laughs> if you're a mammal, it was a good thing. If you were a dinosaur, right. well, now you're a bird. So right. um, maybe that's a good thing too. But the fact sure. of the matter is, we're driving this more quickly, and um, as not entirely due to climate change, but certainly a big part of it, we are currently in the sixth. What's now been recognized as the sixth. sixth mass extinction to which climate change certainly plays a part, the heating oceans, the diminishing coral reefs, you know, we're just seeing extinctions due to climate change all over. Other things are evolving. That's absolutely true. So it's, it's, I, I guess it would be accurate to say that what, one of the things that's really particular about this mass extinction is that there is a species that is talking about mass extinction. That's right. <laughs> um, and that s at least in principle, seems capable of self-consciousness about the process. And this is, gets back to what we were talking about before. We, can, we are capable, I mean, we, we, here we are talking about it. Our brains are capable of, of right and left brain integration to think in these terms. Um, but we also seem capable of, of contributing to our own demise. And that, that just seems... Um, uh, frightening and and um, and you know I, I don't know 
tragic, really. I mean, is it, is it uh, uh, Frederica, do you, do you think, do you, how hopeful are you that we can awaken to take steps that would prevent the process that we've come to understand from actually happening? I mean, do you, do you, do you feel it hopeful that there are things we can do that will, that will make a difference? It depends on the day, <laughs> what I've been reading. Yeah. Um, when I'm in Peru, I'm very hopeful mm -hmm. because there really, I mean, there's a need for that kind of agriculture quite separate from the climate change, and it happens to also affect climate change. And uh, are beginning to work with the school. Mm -hmm. We've been, they are very open, they very mm -hmm. want it. It's worked very well. Uh, the parents are on board. At the beginning, mm -hmm. they didn't want their children to become farmers, but now, yeah. now they love it because mm -hmm. it's... So there I am hopeful, but when I'm here, I'm less hopeful. What I hang on to, and I may be just delusion, <laughs> deluding myself, is this theory, belief, in the tipping point. Mm -hmm. uh, I believe we need to take things into our own hands and do things like right. Barry was saying, and this is what I'm doing, uh, yes. and I'm trying to spread it, you know, yeah. and it's being happening here, it's happening more and more places, uh, you know, gardens, mm -hmm. CSAs, mm -hmm. things that really, we have to do direct action. And my hope is when I'm optimistic, and I tend to be mostly optimistic, uh, is that the tipping point, uh, I mean, I haven't really looked into it deeply because I'm afraid to. <laughs> I have to hang on to my hope. Is that, you know, 10%, mm -hmm. uh, if 10% of the population uh, does this alternative, you will reach a tipping point, like, you know, mm -hmm. like water freezing. All of a sudden, things yeah, will change. Right. When I think about it rationally, I get very scared mm -hmm. and depressed, you know, because so much, as I can see, has to do with the economic system. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I collaborated with an economist who, who, who used to be my husband for decades, and so I, you know, what we are up against is gigantic. It's uh, not only the economic system, but the mode of thought. Yes. Uh, and the greening, you know, quantifying everything is not going to do it. You know, green economics in terms of putting a price mm -hmm. on the services of the environment um, is better, but it's not going to solve the problem. Inadequate. It's mm -hmm. inadequate. Uh, so let me ask you this. Uh, maybe Barry, you want to speak to this. I was um, recently in, in a big research university and talking to some engineers who were working you know, on the, uh, the left brain side, I guess you would say, uh, but thinking about the things they could do, you know, to get that carbon out of this atmosphere to, um, or mitigate, you know, and build the barriers around the cities and, you know, they, they recognize climate change, they recognize it's happening, but they are trying to use technology, capital intensive uh, efforts um, uh, by either corporations or states to, um, uh, mitigate the effects of these changes, and and um, uh, you know I, I was in California, and there's enormous faith in technology among some sectors, right? That that there will be a technological fix, uh, or at least you know a contribution. And I wonder what what your thoughts are about that. Yeah, I think I think it's going to be complex. Um, mm -hmm. We've seen you know discussions about well, if we need to cool the planet off, um, for example, one of the technological solutions is to seed the atmosphere with dust. Mm -hmm. And because it's just based on the fact that when recent volcanoes have gone off, um, like in Atubo mm -hmm. in the Philippines, the Earth's temperature has dropped. Right. But there are side effects to all of that. There's no free lunch, right. as it were. And um, you know, New York City, for example, um, after the the last big hurricane that came through and the storage storm surge in the wake of that turned around and Mayor Bloomberg really they put big things into place because Manhattan, big pieces of lower Manhattan yeah. um, were flooded and they yeah. predict will flood and, and what will they do. Can technology fix everything around the world? I doubt it. Um, and so I, 
like most things, I think balance and, and a mixed mitigate, you know, a combination of mitigation and adaptation strategy is going to be needed um, for some of these big technological solutions. The question is, is can we as a developed nation that's completely hooked um, on fossil fuel burning, can we put in place the technology to allow the biggest contributors to stop heating the planet? Can we change how we use cars? Can we change to higher density living, you know, reduce our surface volume to um, area ratios in the Northeast where or in the northern parts where we don't have, we get more efficient heating. Mm -hmm. That's where we need huge technological solutions, change our energy strategies. And the big question is, is how these nation states and people living in, particularly in developed countries like the United States, um, who use up um, a quarter of all the world's resources with only 4% of the world's populations, yeah. Can we look at the planet as a social good, and how do we how do we incorporate this um, right brain thinking into saying that our conservation, our change in our behavior patterns, will be good for everybody, and particularly for the forthcoming generations, our children? And the sad part is, is that the politics that the governmental styles that we have are too short term yeah. to protect longer term interests because politicians need to get elected in a shorter term period that cannot take the long view. Yeah, and, just, and that gets back to the literacy issue, right? right? Because people, they don't know about the long view right. and they'll act always on their short term interests. Exactly. And it's hard enough to, to balance them, but if you're kept in the dark about the long term, then, then you always, People tend to, to go for that immediate credit. Yeah, a fast point is that a recent um, release by the Yale um, Climate Survey um, shows that actually in the United States now, most people do believe yes. in climate change and that it will be bad. The interesting thing is that when they were asked, do you think it will hurt you or your immediate family? The answer is largely no. Will it hurt other people you know? The answer is yes. <laughs> so it's we have this conundrum right. and people won't take action because most people believe it's not going to hurt them or they can protect their families. It's for others to worry about.